the stigmata. Uh, this is um, one of the unusual uh, paraphenomenal uh, sorts of uh, uh, manifestations of, of God's presence in a person's life that have, has occurred down through uh, church history. Um, Francis himself had the stigmata. Uh, Catherine of uh, Siena had the stigmata. Um, and of course, uh, in our own time, a Capuchin, uh, famous Capuchin, uh, Padre Pio, had the stigmata. And there's been all kinds of uh, medical analyses and so forth of this. But if I were to answer the, the, the question, what is the stigmata, apart from the, the medical analysis, etc., which I certainly do not cheapen because science reinforces faith, faith reinforces science, and there should be no antagonism between the two. Um, how this comes about, I would say, is based on the intensity of a person's life of prayer and a desire for union with God. And almost as a kind of validation that Christ is present in the world and manifests his suffering in the bodies of people like Padre Pio, St. Francis, and Catherine of Siena, it's proof positive for us who are people of faith that he has not abandoned us. He's with us even in the most intensive suffering and that his suffering gives meaning and value uh, to our suffering. How long does it take uh, to become a friar? Well, this is uh, determined uh, by the constitutions of the Capuchin order, uh, but also by the demands of the church. And that is determined by the individual in a long process of discernment, information, and also, you know, with the help of the formation people who help a, a man coming to us to decide which way he can be most fruitful in his life in ministry within the Capuchin order. So the question, how long does it take, is determined by the level of maturity, the level of education, the level of social awareness, and also the capacity of a person to be generous in their life and to move into ever deeper levels of generosity uh, and not self-absorption, but self-donation. And so um, that can be processed formally over the course of about five, six, seven, eight, nine years. If you are within the order and called to the role of a priest, then the educational process is a, a, a little bit longer. There is just um, maybe one other question from the list that I would like to address this morning, and that is um, from a gentleman by the name of Dave, who asked if the present crisis, the, sp the present struggles and so forth in the church is comparable, if it parallels um, the kind of church situation at the time of St. Francis when Jesus said to him, from the cross at San Damiano, uh, rebuild my church. Francis, of course, thought uh, in a kind of limited way that what the crucifix was asking him uh, to do was to just rebuild this dilapidated church. But he came to the realization that that wasn't just a single dilapidated building, but it was the church herself as a whole. I think that uh, the question is very, very good because it does raise the question that the church um, is always in need of reform. Ecclesia reformanda, always in need of her church. The church is always in need of reform. And sometimes what forces that reform are huge problems that develop within the church. And in the history of the church, there have been uh, great times and great struggles and problems. And we are facing into that. And so there is a parallel that we uh, are called as friars, as Capuchin friars, but also all of us who are baptized to help the church, to challenge the church. And by that, I mean not just the hierarchy, not just the leadership people, but those of us in the pews, the membership and the leadership have got to respond to this challenge to rebuild the church. It's easy to point fingers at one group or the other, but it is a challenge for all of us 
to become engaged in rebuilding the church so that she is seen by the world as having a precious light that can guide us, namely Jesus who is the light of the world, offering us um, the nourishment of the sacraments, particularly uh, the Eucharist, but also an institution that needs to be transparent and not involved in any kind of duplicity, mendacity, or deceptiveness so that people can come and know the church and love the church and develop what Pope Paul VI said in his wonderful encyclical many years ago, Ecclesiam Suam, that the church is our mother and that you don't abandon your mother when your mother is dysfunctional and her behavior towards you is toxic. You work with her, you challenge her, and you call her to an understanding again of her role. So, as Capuchins, uh, we listen, hopefully, to the needs of people. We accept petitions, prayer petitions, which is one of the questions also in the sheet uh, from uh, a woman by the name of Dilip Alva, who asks, uh, do the Capuchins accept prayer petitions? If you were to, to come here to St. Francis Friary, uh, where 10 of us live together, and go up into the chapel, there's a prayer board right outside the chapel. And that prayer board is filled with slips of paper that we have all put there from people who have asked us to pray for them, for their families, for their needs, and so forth. So we do indeed um, happily accept prayer petitions. And in our morning prayers and in our evening prayers, we pray for the people on those prayer boards and for all of our benefactors who are so good to us and who help us accomplish the little bit that we're able to accomplish, which we could not accomplish uh, without their help.